Wayne County Community College attracted one of the nation's most known civil rights activists. I'm Michaela Armstead reporting. Reverend Jesse Jackson, uh, over, over many years, has been on the front lines of many, many of uh, the relevant issues uh, of our day. And he remains relevant uh, in this season of his life as he has been for over 12 months now fighting for democracy. Liberty should not be lynched. Democracy should not be destroyed. Uh, but he's not just a negative fighter. He's not just a deconstructionist, though he has a great analytical mind. He's also a constructionist. He has proposals and solutions for how Detroit, Michigan, and the nation can make its way out of the conundrum we find ourselves in. So we're happy to have him here today. And who else uh, to lead the discussion, to get it going, than Detroit's greatest, one of Detroit's greatest talents, greatest minds, greatest commentators, uh, my friend and brother, Mr. Ed. Foxworth, put your hands together. Go ahead, Foxworth. This global conversation we are so excited to have uh, with the former presidential candidate uh, of the United States. This is indeed an honor, and uh, we are recognizing history as we sit here today. Reverend Jackson, 40 years on the forefront. Tell us a little bit about what you're seeing today in comparison to what you saw in the days of uh, Martin Luther King. In many ways, we've seen a, an advance of progress. We've seen an, an overlay of growth, and we've seen an undercurrent loss at the games. I was blessed in my life in time to go to Selma, Alabama in 1965, fighting for the right to vote. And then 40 years of working through schemes that sought to alter the impact of that vote. Then we've seen voter suppression, a scheme to make voting more difficult. And now in Michigan we see schemes of making the vote null and void. To go from fighting the right to vote to altering it. By altering I mean you can vote, but you, if you properly, if you don't properly apportion, gerrymandering, annexation, at large, role purging can undermine the ability to win. And then we've seen this year voter, voter suppression where we want to make seniors in 38 states show a birth certificate, many of whom do not have one. And to get one, we require them uh, to get to buy one on a fixed income that amounts to a poll tax. Our students uh, now have the right to vote where they actually attend school. If you are, if you're in Ann Arbor in school and you are from Chicago, you can vote where you actually attend. Voting acts are trying to make it more difficult. And what the data shows is that for African Americans and Latinos. The Voter Suppression Act creates more disparities, so we've seen suppression. In Michigan, we see an attempt to nullify the vote, where you use a plan based upon the crisis to um, uh, set aside the mayor and council, called the emergency management, in Ben Harbor, in Pontiac, in, uh, in Flint, in, in Saginaw, now in Detroit. And in an extraordinary kind of way, a state uses its power to determine it will, in fact, use its power to intervene uh, and nullify the elected mayor and uh, his or her powers and the elected council, and then intervene into labor contracts to nullify them, then sell off city properties to balance the budget. This is extraordinary attack upon democracy. So that's one thing we've seen. The second bit we've seen is that uh, there's an attempt to separate Detroit from Michigan. There's Detroit and there's Michigan. Detroit happens to be Detroit, Michigan's main artery. You cannot separate your main artery from your body. Detroit has been the source of Michigan's growth. It's a city by the river, a city that connects Michigan with Canada. So in many ways, so goes Detroit, goes Michigan, and so goes Michigan, goes the nation. And so, but there are some rules that govern the main artery for reasons I think to be cultural. That is jeopardizing the whole state. That is, for example, the highest car insurance rate in America is in Detroit. People paying five to $800 a month for car insurance as much as their car note. 
or sometimes as much as the house look. And that's different. Uh, in Detroit, 12 to 15,000 city employees, police, teachers, firemen, and the like, who work here but don't live here. So they take with them their selves to purchase houses and cars, use service stations and drug stores and grocery stores outside the city to break it down a, a honeybee, which is said to be brainless. A honeybee gets nectar from a flower, but it doesn't just fly away. It drops pollen when it picks up nectar. So when it flies away and it grows empty, it comes back because the pollen is regenerated, you can keep on living. But if you get dropped nectar here, and so pollen, you kill the flower. So even honeybees know that you should understand the law of regeneration. So if 15,000 people who work here live here, your next door neighbor is a policeman, or a teacher, or a farmer, and down the street you have a, a grocery store and a drugs and a place to shop, because you protected that base, and that's a piece of it. Another piece of it is that the state of Michigan owes Detroit about 200 plus million dollars. And then an the attempt to determine that we will pay you on the condition that you accept our plan for you. That's different, it seems to me. Uh, you have another mention where we bail out the automotive industry because they were in crisis, but that did not translate into bailing out those who made it possible. That's right. That's right. Well, so the, the new market for the bailout of the automotive industry is, is China. Well, it doesn't stop there. The banks are a part of this. Right. Right. 100,000 vacant homes and abandoned lots. I went with Ribbon uh, Flowers at Mount Moriah one morning. Some ministers across the street, there was a, a, a house, a worn house. And I asked the ministers, what do you see? They said, well, we see weeds. I said, what else do you see? What do you mean? Said, what do you see? Well, we see boards. What do you see? What do you mean? I said, what you really see is, the, what, do you see those weeds? That's called a job for landscapers. Those boards, that's what you need, window panes. And that means the glassmaker will have a job. What you see is the need for painting and glazing and what realization. What you really see is about 100 jobs. So if the banks have abandoned these homes, if 25% were reconstructed, you'd have more jobs than people. But if you do not have the bankers who robbed you at the table, there could be no plan for reconstruction. And so uh, my last point simply is that 90% uh, of all Detroit jobs, workers work outside Detroit. So if you're on welfare and can't own a car, and without public transportation, you can't get to where the jobs are, then you're trapped into you're recycling poverty, pain, uh, and you're into resegregation. And so if you uh, the plants leave, the homes are foreclosed, you lose your tax base. You lose tax base, you can't get your children. You can't hire teachers. This man said, well, something's wrong with you. If you have a size 10 foot, a size 8 shoe, nothing's wrong with your foot. Something's wrong with the shoe. Because you have a structural abnormality. So my recommendation uh, is that as opposed to from an emergency manager, it must be planned for emergency reconstruction. Who would be at that table? That's not just the governor, the mayor, and the council. And since Michigan is in fact Detroit is the largest city in Detroit, since it is the artery that feeds the rest of the state, since it is the international artery, since it is the, the brand name capital value for Michigan, Detroit, Michigan, since that be true, then you need at that table, you've got 15 congressmen in the state who benefit from Detroit. You've got two U.S. senators who benefit from Detroit. You've got bankers who benefit from violated Detroit. You have insurance companies who benefit. So I suggest that those, that bother of Congress people and senators uh, and labor and bankers all along at that table to put a plan for reconstructing 
Michigan's major city of Detroit. If we think in those terms, we talk about creating jobs. Today, if you cut a deal, uh, that would those who say, if you were to cut a deal today, lay off more police, more teachers, more firemen, more workers, you'll be stronger. How are you, when you need more jobs, how is cutting more, in fact, going to gain more? I would argue that we have, we must have the need, uh, Mr. Moderator, of a plan to reconstruct, not just a plan to constrict. As we sit in this fantastic uh, educational facil facility, uh, every nine seconds during the school year, a student drops out of school. We have these recycling problems as it relates to education. Ernie Duncan, Duncan, the Secretary of Education, has called the Detroit Public School System a, uh, a, a shame or a negative in terms of the entire landscape. Why and what will it take uh, to turn our educational system around? Well, shame is a limited analysis of what's happening. They're not just dropping out, they're being expelled out. This whole Craven modern crisis starts with a student being expelled or suspended from school for an empty bag of marijuana. That child's mother should have been called in house supervision and loss or wreck your way out of your problem. That boy was a suspended and then went to Sanford and then race profile uh, and then uh, pursued and then kill, and we'll talk about the rest that's related, but it started with suspension. When children are put out of school, where do they go? Where, do, where is that for them to go? A recreation center down the street, they got clothes? Where is that for them to go? A park down the street that's no longer supervised? Where is it them for go? Except to feed a new $300 million jail downtown Detroit. Well, Detroit cannot find $200 million for the budget. They're building a three hundred million dollar jail downtown. What a simple. When Jennifer Hudson's mother and father, mother and brother were killed, I remember we went out the neighborhood that night and had prayer. And while praying, uh, I thought I heard some footprints over my eyes and saw some little game bangers coming my way. And the, and the, and the youngest one came and said, Reverend, we, I want to get well. He was crying, but they closed the detox centers. I want to get well. He's 15. Then two more walked up to me, a little older, and said, Look, Rick, we just came out the joint. Like, we can't get no job. We've got this training in jail. We can't get no job. And I embraced all three of them. And I was embraced them trying to figure out what to say to them. If I send them down the street to the school, they get five meals a week and still no place to stay and no medicine. But if they go to jail, they get 21 meals a week. Warm in the wintertime, cool in the summertime, organized recreation. So for them, jail becomes a homeless shelter. Yeah. Yeah. Jail becomes a hotel. They jump up and touch the basement. And so now as we speak of how we cannot raise the budget to restructure the economy here comprehensively, we still can find the money to build a $300 million jail. That set of priorities must change. And that becomes our challenge today. We can, prenatal care, head start and day, and day care, say prenatal care, head start and day care on the front side rather than jail care and welfare on the back side. We're going to pay. It's a matter of paying on the front side, you get more in your return on your investment. There is this ongoing challenge that we have with crime in urban communities, and Detroit has seen its share. Uh, babies, senior citizens getting beat up at gas stations. It has been a really bad time. Homicides are at an all-time high, even compared to last year. Crime in urban communities, and Detroit specifically, the urban America is almost a protracted, st a protracted state of crime mm. and violence internalized and or expressed in many ways. There are shootings in Detroit, but there's not one gunshot. Mm -hmm. 
there are shootings in Detroit. There's not one gun manufacturer. Who manufactures them? Who sells them? And, and, who, and who sets up Detroit as a market? There are drugs in Detroit. They don't grow drugs in Detroit. So where do they come from? Plants, clothes, jobs leave, drugs and guns come as an economy. That is a factor in this. Secondly, when I use have at school music, can you imagine cutting music out of schools in Detroit? The home of Motown? Without music in schools? Cutting art from schools in Detroit and calling it schools? Schools without choirs? Without bands? Without um, the recreation hour? Without physical education? That's not a school, that's a woman's place. And then right across the border, you have first class schools and a tax base. Well, that's a part of recolonization. That's its de facto apartheid. Yeah. And so we must resist the crime. We also we saw, must also resist the double standard for, for crime. You know and I know, uh, a people in the occupation attack who is vulnerable. If a black attacks white, it's jail time. It's first degree, it's an execution time. Black, white attacks of black, it's revolt time. Seven blacks are killed in Detroit last weekend by whites. Oh, the whole world coming. In Detroit, seven whites today, blacks are killed. So if blacks attack whites, it's jail time. Whites attack blacks, revolt time. Black attack black, a white attack white, it's military. As if that is a lower standard based upon intra group killing as opposed to intra group killing. Nobody has the right to kill anybody. All these killings must be considered a hate crime. Then from YNN Logan Network, we have two bright stars uh, from the Detroit community. Uh, Edward McNeil, a junior at Oak Park High School, will be responding. And Michaela Armstead, a freshman at Cass Tech, she will be responding as well. We're going to kind of go down here front, ladies first. And what else do you think um, should be a, dis a discipline for fighting? Those 20 days are 20 days of a chance to get pregnant yeah. while your mother and father are going to work. Yeah. It's 20 days of drift away from study. Yeah. It's 20 days of street wandering. Yeah. It's often 20 days to slam the predicate for jail. Mm -hmm. Schools must make room to develop youth. All youth, um, like all flowers don't bloom at the same time, all of us don't mature at the same time. For the, except in the most extreme cases, when there is an altercation, there must be some room for rehabilitation. Yeah. Some room for development. Kicking youth out of school tends to be the first step towards staying out of school. Yeah. And that's not the purpose. That's why you got to watch these charter schools that are great that are judged by rating rather than development. Some of us are slow learners. Yeah. Uh, I was a slow learner. One of the teenage mother, under very difficult circumstances, and they had a hard time catching on to some stuff. But there were some teachers who were into developmental education, not just test grade education. Mm -hmm. And in time, I was able to develop and overcome, which is what developmental education is all about. Right. If you're just going to pick those who do, who well. got on the fast track from the beginning, that's Nebuchadnezzar, my dear, that's pick out the three Hebrew boys that's got all these talents and leave the rest of them behind. We must be slow uh, to put out and quick to embrace. I do not remember, Joanne, in 12th high school, a single expulsion. Remember a couple of kids getting in some trouble and the, the mama got called, for God forbid, the daddy got called and came to the school. I do not remember a single expulsion in 12 years. 
who just didn't send kids home with no place to go. Hello. Yeah. My name is Edward McNeil, and I'm a junior at Oak Park High School. And you know, I'm a regular teenager, and I attend high school, and I'm wondering, I'm curious, what should or what could me and my peers be doing to help solve some of these issues as it relates to social injustice and, you know, make a difference? There are two or three things that come to mind immediately. Let me see Thank you so much. First of all, take your studying seriously. You can't, you can't be in the rhythm of youthful indiscretion for until grade 11 and graduate in grade 12. Because she will graduate with a diploma and no information. So the first thing you should do is take your studying seriously. Secondly, Try to gravitate to friends who are into studying. Try to, right. try, try to choose you a group that's kind of into that. Right. Thirdly, um, if you are 17 or older, you are eligible to register and vote this year. Mm -hmm. All high school seniors should come across that stage with a pool in one hand and a vote card in the other. You have the power to register and vote. All students at this community college, that's right. all of you, who want lower tuition? Want a job? All any student at this school not registered is, is a disgrace. Every college student is eligible to register and vote now. Why did I say that? Because whenever young America comes alive, the whole nation changes. You're not too you're not too young to march in the demonstration to revive a battle of assault weapons. You're not too young. To, to, mama, you, you registered. Mama, mama, I can't vote, vote for me. Mm -hmm. Dad, vote for me. So, one, take your self seriously. And lastly, is don't self destruct. Right. Today, at your age, you are free to grow or to disintegrate. Mm -hmm. You're free to step in front of a moving car. You're not free to avoid the consequences. Mm -hmm. You're free to not study tonight. The test time tomorrow morning. You're not free to know the answer. Mm -hmm. So as you grow, you must accept certain responsibilities. One of them is strong minds break strong chains. Mm -hmm. If you think it's not important, when you do graduate, you're not going to the, the buddy buddy. You're going to the doctor who you think got some information. You get in trouble, you want to go to the lawyer who you think got some information. And I'm appealing to you. You think through how to avoid the, the drug and gun culture. Reverend Jesse Jackson left the audience strong messages about what we can do to make a difference. I'm Edward McNeil from YNN Logan Network, where we bring you the younger side of the news.